Fasted for forty days, we become to him a nation everlasting, acquiring all our needs through fasting. Fasting cannot be without prayer. In humility and worship, they are up there. And our request before him.
براتون No, all together. We're all together. All together. <coughs> take our seats, but you'll notice that we don't have enough seats. That's because we need to get some more seats. Uh, we weren't supposed to be here today, but we asked Amora Dave and permission to break some rules. He's going to get in trouble. <coughs> and so we're here. Mina's going to be speaking to us today. I'm sorry that there isn't enough seats. But thank you, Amora, for <coughs> trouble for us to allow us to be here today. Uh, I've got my job on the line <laughs> for you guys, okay? Job or neck? My job. That's fine. This, my job on the line for getting it down here. So please, please, <coughs> please <coughs> or else I will be excommunicated. <laughs> I'll leave Mina to talk to you about who is God. Rabbi Nayoster Fahlan. No, I have. Kali Mike. All right, guys, those at the back, can you guys come to the front, maybe? Maybe we can push the chairs a little bit back and people can sit here on the floor, possibly. Yala, yala, come on, let's push the chairs a little bit back and people s standing in the back come and sit in the front, if you guys can. <coughs> yala, come on, quick, 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 move it, move it, move it. <coughs> Thank you. And now people standing in the back, come and sit in the front. You have the floor. But then, uh, that, that's more than enough. Come on, everyone. Everyone in the back, come sit in the front, please. 
so you guys can see. Come on, come on. Guys, guys at the back, standing in the back, come and sit in the front, please, so we can start. Mark, Amy, come on, Iman, Monique, Nazi, come to the front, come to the front. Daniel, Rachel, okay, thank you, thank you, Miriam. <coughs> All right, fantastic. So, um, you might have heard today's sermon by Abuna David. I don't know where he is. He left. Okay. Um, today is the Sunday of preparation, and tomorrow we're going to start Lent. Lent is going to be for the 55 days up until the resurrection. So, every single week we have a specific reading on the Sundays. Um, we're going to go through a Lenten series, starting from today, about who is God, and we're going to talk about one specific element or a characteristics in God's character for us. Guys, and some Mina sorts things out. Let's have a, a quick uh, revision quiz. What's this Sunday in Lent? This Sunday, what's it called? Excellent. Preparation Sunday. What's the gospel about? Over here today. Preparing, uh huh. It says, uh, "Don't uh, do your fasting in secret." Is one of the key themes. There's um, a, a booklet we've sent out on PDF that has a verse for a day, contemplation for the day. You can look at a video for that day. If you want to do some extra reading, you can read a chapter from Matthew's Gospel, and if you've really got time, then a chapter from Genesis. Every day we'll have a set of readings. What's next week? next Sunday. So today's was Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 to 15 1 to 16. What's next week? Sorry? Treasure Sunday, yes. And that's the continuing of Matthew chapter 6. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. And um, it reminds us that we've, we've started Lent. Let's make sure our treasure is in heaven, that we're invested not on earthly things. We've started fasting, we've started alms giving, we've started praying more. But let's remember that our treasure is in heaven. What's the Sunday after that? I hope I'm not stealing your material, Nino. Ah, brilliant. Finally. Nino and Karen. All right. So sorry, guys. So we're going to start with uh, a question. God for me is amazing. Finally, it's working. Thank you. God for me is salvation, hope, encouragement, home, everything, love, refuge, friend, strength, father, merciful, master, healer, protector. Anyone else? <clears throat> All right. So these, these were many, many answers. Thank you guys for that. We're going to look into the next question. And I want you to think before answering, because the obvious answer could be yes. But before we answer yes, I want you guys to reflect a little bit. Do we consider, does each of us consider God to be our father? Oh, yeah. Like my dad? Do I deal with him as my dad? So think and answer honestly. <laughs> Guys at the back, do you want to come to the front? No? Well, I'm very pleased that everyone is, yes, that's honesty, I like that. Thank you. So you have some people who are not considering God to be their father. That's very good. That's honest. I agree with that. Mina? Yes. Um, the same, my phone was just not functioning. I said, I'm 
Oh, okay. <laughs> That's all right. At least we're going to see today, we might consider him as our father, but do we actually deal with him as our father? That's what we're going to cover up today. All right. And the last question, what are the characteristics of a father? What does a father provide? Love, acceptance, protection, safety, correction, correction support, Peace, inheritance, guidance, advice, stability, example, blessings. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. So, the series that we're going to be starting in Lent is going to be discovering God as our Father. We're going to go through Lent every single week. We know the readings as Ehab was introducing them. Like, next week is going to be the Treasure Sunday, the week after the Temptation the prodigal son, the Samaritan woman. Each week, we're going to look into the readings, we're going to look into that Sunday, trying to discover God as our Father. What does it mean for God to be our Father? How are we going to interact with that? So today, we're just going to try to understand when is this concept happened, why it's happening, what do we get from it very, very briefly, and then we're going to dive deeply each week in this. All right. Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he sees that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. So the first question that comes to mind is why? Why did the disciples ask Jesus, teach us to pray? Anyone? I'm not going to keep on talking by myself. You guys need to engage. There are some other mics, I guess. Because they want to learn more. They want to learn more. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? There is a certain etiquette to pray. Thank you. Anyone else? Amy? Because they wanted their prayers to be answered. Thank you. Yes? Um, so like when you, because you, when you pray, we pray to God. And considering like Jesus is God, asking him how to pray to him is like asking a teacher what's going to be on their exam. Like it's the same idea. You know what I mean? All right. Thank you. Eden? For guidance. Sorry? For guidance. Wait, wait, wait. For guidance? All right. Anyone else? Yes, David and Auntie Afer. Um, wasn't part of the reason Jesus came down to set an example for us, but just general life. Fantastic. Thank you. Because they have seen Jesus praying, so they want to be. Oh, that was going to be my one. Fantastic. So they have seen Jesus praying, and they want to be like him, Ibrahim. I think they were thinking, uh, before this verse, there was a discussion among the Pharisees when they were told, when they were saying, why are you not fasting, and so on. So they were thinking that Jesus would, like, you know, give them, like, some sorts of rituals, or, like, you know, how to, like, pray properly, wash, for example, and things like that. Because, <coughs> like, you know, they, they were being uh, told by the Pharisees, you're not doing the right thing. And maybe they wanted to figure out how he wants us to pray, and it's the <coughs> rituals, he just gave them the Lord's Prayer. Thank you. Anyone else? I think they yes, John? Foster the God when they realized Jesus is a God. And uh, they, they, they wanted some sort of cheat sheet. Right? <laughs> All right. The best way to connect to our Lord, the God the Father. So they, they asked Lord how we can pray. So the Lord taught them, taught them the, the famous prayer, which we always pray every day, which is, to be honest, is crown to the crown. So <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. 
anyone else. All right, so all of what you guys have said is absolutely correct. But there was one very important thing that made them ask Jesus that, which is they have felt something different. We know about prayer. We know about the Pharisees praying. We know about the Old Testament people praying. But this time, it felt a little bit different. Your prayer, Jesus, is different than our prayer. So teach us how to pray. Why is it that you're praying this way and we're feeling something very different than when we are praying? We have grown up learning about praying, hearing about people praying, but you pray differently. There is something that is missing in our prayer that please teach us how to pray. So Jesus replied back and said this, Our Father who art in heaven. When you guys want to pray, pray, Our Father who art in heaven. And this was a new thing. This was not there before. People did not know that God is our Father. This was a very, very new concept, that God is our Father. And in all honesty, this is very exclusive to only Christians. If you look around the world, anyone who believes that God exists will not understand that God is their Father except in Christianity. In Christianity, having God to be our Father is very, very exclusive. It's very, very unique to us. And we didn't know about this from before. Or actually, we knew, but it got tainted. We're going to go through that in a few minutes. But Jesus came to reintroduce that again. So when did it happen the very first time that Jesus introduced God to be our Father? Anyone remembers? When was it the very first time that people started hearing that God is our Father? Yes? No? No, sorry. All right. Anyone? So this was in Luke 11. Yes? Natalie? Sorry, Roxy? I thought maybe Jesus in the temple when he was a child. Jesus in the temple when he was a child. Very good. He said... Why are you bothering me? I am here for my father's business. But he didn't say that this is your father. He said, this is my father's business. So, anyone else? No? The very first time that Jesus introduced the concept to the disciples and to everyone that God is our father was in the Sermon on the Mount. And if you look in the Sermon of the Mount, you will find Jesus talking about God being our Father over and over and over again. When you pray, I think you guys have heard this today, in today's Gospel, and that's why we're talking about this today. When you pray, go into your room and when you shut your door, pray to your Father. When you fast... When you give alms, what did he say? Your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. How many times did he say this? Three times. Giving alms, prayer and fasting. He kept on repeating, your father in heaven. Your father in heaven. And this was the very first time Jesus, as if he's trying to change the mentality of everyone listening, that guys, this is a concept that you guys need to understand. God is our Father. And let's look at the verses. For if you forgive men that trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Next. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. If you then being even know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father 
in heaven give good things to those who ask them. Even so it will not be the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Do you guys see throughout Jesus' ministry, throughout all of the Gospels, Jesus is repeating over and over and over again a new kind of a relationship. God is not just there. God is not the creator who left us. No. God is our Father. So do you guys remember the question that I asked a little bit before? Who of us consider God to be our Father? Do we actually consider God to be our Father? Without showing of hands, just you guys reflect. How do we approach Him? How do we speak with Him? What is it that we're waiting from Him? How are we feeling about Him? How are we receiving these feelings from Him? Does that make sense? This is, this is a new relationship. So he said, but as many as receive them, to them, only those who receive them, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So this is what he's trying to tell us. You guys, now when you believe who I am, who God is, you have to understand, you guys became children of God. And throughout Lent, all of the season of Lent, the church is very, very clever. You will find the hymn, and so on. What? Our Father who art in heaven. And we keep on singing it loudly and longly and in all kinds of tunes. Why? Because the church is teaching us, guys, this is our father. Keep on calling him our dad. <clears throat> Sorry. All right. So what? So what that God is our father? Come on. So what? What does that entail? Don't understand the question. You don't understand the question. What would it be to you that God is your father? Yes, Moses. I think that it tells that as a lot of people might view God being as divine and powerful as he is, he still wants to have a very intimate relationship with us as opposed to him just being very distant from us. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, Christine. Thank you. Um, so for me personally, I find a lot of comfort in seeing God as like my actual dad. And I think a lot of us, our Heavenly Fathers might not be up to our expectations so it's very very satisfying that I have a father I have a dad who is literally perfection so even when my earthly father is annoying me and giving me a headache I'm like okay that's fine you're just an earthly father anyways like I have the best father waiting for me happy there. mother's days to oh, those yeah, are yeah, <laughs> but it's so satisfying knowing that I have him and I'm like that's fine I have my heavenly father it's, it's, it's really restoring fantastic Yes, David? Like, undoubtedly has our best interest in mind and in heart. So sometimes it might, similar to like our earthly father, they might go against what we want uh, immediately, but long term they know he knows what's best for us and wants the best for us, even if it might go against us. Also, like, a tough disciplinary figure. It's very, like, basically like a father, just a heavenly father. Fantastic. Thank you. Anyone else? Jesse. There is another mic floating around. Uh, I would say, considering your earthly father would have been there, conception, birth, watched you grow, watched you change, and kind of discovers all your uh, most, your idiosyncrasies, all your traits, knows who you are inside and out. Um, Heavenly Father goes one step further than that, which is he's the one that ordered all those individual traits because he sees the beginning and he sees the end. But I think what people often miss, myself included, is that when you're looking for God within his majesty, that's, that's more of a fact, whereas uh, an attribute of who he is and his personality is his desire to be very, very close to you. Um, 
and for you to know him as well and know who he is because he already knows who you are but once you know who he is that's when the relationship really comes together fantastic thank you jesse anyone else yes natalie um, i would say it feels a bit more personal you know uh, my relationship with god i, I don't know why but I, I just thought obviously you know my, my father on earth it's a very personal relationship so when i see god like my father it's very personal as well thank you anyone else Wants it. All right. Sorry? Feeling home. Thank you, Amani. Feeling home. Yes. So, guys, this is actually the story of humanity. God created us from the very beginning with this kind of intimate relationship with Him. When He created us, He was walking with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. This is the kind of relationship he had with them. But with the fall of humanity, we decided that we have rejected God as our father. We, has, we have rejected his fatherhood for us. And we made that distance. No, I don't want you to tell me what's right and what's wrong. I am going to do what I think is right for me. I'm going to decide whether to eat from the tree or not to eat from the tree. I don't want your guidance. I don't want your fatherhood. I don't want you in my life altogether. And humanity fell and has strayed far, far away from God. Up until Jesus came back, or sorry, not came back, came incarnate to tell us, guys, I want you to remember God is your father and all you need to do is pretty much this look now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry he was the son of so it was thought of Joseph and then we have a long list son of son of son of son of son of up until the son of Adam the son of god we haven't heard this for a very 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 long time throughout all of the old testament why because humanity forgot that adam was created as a child of god we had this relationship with god that we lost by our own self we decided to lose this relationship with god so when jesus came he was trying to tell us from the very beginning, guys, I want you to remember, God is your father. And he gave us this example. He told us this story, which we're going to go through in a few weeks time. The story of the prodigal son, and this is the story of humanity. We are strayed away from God by our own selves, by our own decision. We didn't want him we strayed away, we told him, I am better by myself. I want to live my life away from you. Give me my inheritance, whatever it is, I'm going to take it. Everything that you're giving me, my health, my wealth, my money, my, all my gifts that you have given me, I want to take them and go have fun with my friends. And then what happened to the guy? He lost everything. And finally, when he realized, I have a father, let me go back to the father. And when he got back to the father, this was the father's feelings toward him. That's what the father did. The father embraced him. So Jesus, when he came, he came to tell us, guys, your father is in heaven waiting for you. And that's all you need to do. So when you go to pray, our Father who art in heaven. So every single time you guys stand up to pray, I want you to remember, we're not talking to anyone. When you start our, our Father who art in heaven, that's not a prayer. Let's take it a little bit slowly. And when you start by praying, our Father who art in heaven, just Take a few seconds, reflect, this is my dad. 
I'm actually talking to my dad. So what is, it, what is it in for me that God is my father, that he's accepting me? We're going to talk today about three things. And I was hoping that you guys have covered them. What are the characteristics of fatherhood or of a father that you guys are aiming for? We're going to try to sum them up because you've mentioned many, many things into three main things. The first one is going to be love. My father, he loves me. And let's look at this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the love of the father. And if you go back in the Old Testament, you will find it's still there. We just didn't acknowledge it. We didn't understand it. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And we can see in the Bible, throughout all of the Bible, the love of God. And this love is forever. And that's the difference. That's the difference between the love that we can receive from anyone and the love that we're receiving from God. The love that we receive from anyone could be temporary. Whether it is between husband and wife, sometimes they get upset from one another and then they feel, ah, I don't want to speak to you today. That doesn't happen with God. You can speak with him anytime. Children and parents, when they grow up, they start going into teenage and I want my independence. Friends, whatever you name it. This is the only love that is guaranteed because we hear in the Bible very, very clearly. There is a specific verse in the Bible. God is love. The definition of love is God himself. God is love. So the world's love says, I love you if, if you do this, if you're nice to me, I'm going to be nice to you and I'm going to love you. If you do this for me, I'm going to love you. If we have this relationship and you honor me, I'm going to love you. That's the world's love. I love you if. But God's love is different. God loves is I love you even if. And that's very, very unique to God. And that's why we're starving. We're starving from emotions because I want this relationship. I want my children to love me. I want my spouse to love me. I want my friends to love me. And we keep on going out, I'm so sorry to say it, like beggars, begging for emotions, begging for feelings from people, begging for our friends, our partners, whoever they are, to receive these emotions. While God is there waiting to flood us with these emotions. Look, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, the present nor the future, nor any other power, neither height nor depth nor anything in creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is telling us, guys, no matter what you do, I still love you. Do you guys remember the prodigal son story that we just shared a minute ago? The guy is coming back literally, betrayed his father, coming back in his filthy clothes, covered with mud. He was eating the pig's food, smelly. And what did the father do? He didn't care about any of that. Just come and I'm going to embrace you. Sometimes when we fall apart with friends or partners or whatever it is, don't speak to me again unless you realize what you've done. I'm sure you guys have heard it many times, right? All the time. That, that wasn't the father. The father just embraced his son. The fact that he just went to him was more than enough to receive all the love he needed. And that's what we need. We don't need the love from others. Yes, it's an emotional need, but if we receive it from the Father, if we receive it from our Father, we're not going to be begging for these emotions 
anymore. So if you're feeling unloved, remember. Remember we have our father. I can go, as he said, into my room, close my door, and I stay there. And I promise you guys, he's going to do this. The more we're sitting with him, the more he's going to pour into our hearts. More and more and more. And that's what he said, whoever drinks from the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And we see this in people around us going through different things and they are still pouring out love. Where are they getting this love from? You should be you should be hating your life, basically. But instead, they are pouring out love to others. From where? Is it theirs? Absolutely not. Because they are receiving, they are pouring out to others and more. So anytime you guys any of us is feeling tired, feeling unloved, feeling I need to receive, just go. Close your door and sit and you will receive much more than you can ever think or imagine. All right, any questions? Yes, Ibrahim. So, I think, uh, you know, I personally find that Like, you know, something unfair happens to me in life. And, like, you know, when something good happens, yeah, I feel God's love. But whenever, like, you know, something is, like, you know, is unfair or something, you know, really happens, like, you know, I just, the like, first question that I ask myself is, like, what is God's love from all of you? Like, you know, from what happened? Fantastic question. I absolutely love your honesty. Thank you very much. Yes, you're absolutely correct. So, Ibrahim is right. We usually feel the God's love when things are going good. But when things are not going so good, we tend to not feel his love anymore. And the reason behind this is very, very simple. Because we're not feeling that God is that. We're feeling that God is the genie of the lamp. Why? Because we rub the lamp, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. And when he brings what we asked for, you're a good genie. Thank you so much. I love you. But when he doesn't, then we don't feel that love. And that's because of the relationship. If I am actually feeling that God is my dad, there are lots of elements surrounding that. I need to trust him. Many times Emma would come and ask me, Daddy, I want this. I said, no. But she get upset for a little bit. But if she knows that I love her and she trusts that I am taking care of her no matter what, then this feeling will very quickly go away. Why? Because she knows that I care about her and that I love her. So she will receive the love differently. Can I have a hug instead? Okay. So the question about the genie of the lamp, it's not about the wishes. So things might go hard in our lives. And actually Jesus has said it very, very clearly. In the world, you might, maybe, he didn't say that, in the world, you will have tribulations. So we will have tribulations in the world. It's guaranteed. So with every single time we go into tribulation, we, would, we feel that God does not love us, then we're not in the right relationship with him. Then we're not feeling that he's God. And we're not feeling sorry that he's our dad. We're just feeling that he's there. I am here. I'm tired. You don't feel it. Stay there. I'm here. I'm going to sort myself out. But that's not what we're trying to say today. We're trying to say that God is our dad. And by him being our dad, we need to feel all of these things. We need to mend this relationship. Does that make sense? It's, it's difficult, but... It's, of course. It's, it's, yeah, it makes <clears throat> sense it, on, like, you know, on a theoretical basis. Like, you know, because we are Christian, yeah, we understand that. But I just, 
But I think to feel that truly is is just a bit difficult. Can I make a comment on this? Of course. <coughs> When a man and a uh, woman get together at the beginning of the creation, the chance is 1 in 65 million, 65 million cells. So the God give, us, give me, you, him, her, the chance to be here. So in one regard, we are being hand-picked between 50, 65 million chances. So. It shows that God loves us because He handpicked us and He chose us. Thank you, John. Any other questions? Yes, Miriam? I think in the comment for Ibrahim, I think sometimes, yes, as you said, that we can't, it's, it's a theoretical thing, but sometimes if you go to God, tell Him, I'm not accepting this, and start fighting with Him, He still accepts this. And he will get you to accept it. He knows when you speak to him and when you fight, say, I'm not able to believe this, to take this. I think he, he gives you the, the feeling and the calm down and the peace about what's happening at that time. So you're a doctor. I'm going to give you an example from a doctor perspective. If I am feeling sick, if I have a virus, if I have a bacteria, I need to take an antibiotic, right? And for example, the antibiotic dose is I have to take the antibiotic three times a day for a whole week or two weeks, right? So this is the dose to get me healed, yeah? If I decided instead of taking the antibiotic three times a day for two weeks, instead I'm going to have it once every three days, how would I feel? Will I get healed? No, I wouldn't get healed. I would feel rubbish, right? This is exactly the case. I am feeling unloved. This is my feeling. I'm feeling rejected. I'm feeling tired. I am feeling down. I need to go into my room, close that door, and sit. But what we do is, God, I'm really tired. Can you do something, please? Oh, you haven't done anything. Bye. That's pretty much what we do. We sit with the Bible. We sit with God. Five minutes stops. And then, ah. God is not doing anything, I'm still feeling unloved, I'm still feeling tired. I don't think he loves me. But if we actually take the proper dose, if we actually sit, and this season is the season to sit with God. It's a season the church is preparing for us, fasting and prayer. We need to invest in our spiritual life. We need to take time, proper time every day, sit with the Bible, Sit with yourselves and pray, Lord, I am feeling this. I want you to change this feeling. Jacob didn't let him go up until he received the blessing. He stayed the whole night. Can we do it? I'm not going to leave my room. I'm not going to leave this prayer time up until I receive a blessing from you. I'm not going to leave. Sort me out, sort my heart out, sort my feelings out. I'm tired of this world, fine. But I'm not going to leave up until you sort me out. Takes 15 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour. Have we tried it? We sit in front of the TV for two hours watching a movie. That we can sit. We can talk on the phone to our friends for two hours. That we can do. Have we tried to sit with him for a little bit longer? to feel this because this is the feeling that the Samaritan women have taken after she sat down with him she felt satisfied she actually left everything and she went to preach about who Jesus is she had five husbands and one more guy she didn't care about any of these anymore why? Because she felt the satisfaction just by one dialogue, one sitting with God, made a whole difference in her life. Does that make sense? All right, two. What? This is one big feeling, feeling loved, feeling accepted, right? Feeling forgiven. He's going to love me no matter what. 
He's going to forgive me no matter what. He's accepting me no matter what. What's the second big feeling that we're going to receive from our Father? And you guys have said it. Anyone? Quickly. Guidance. Sorry? Guidance. Guidance. Thank you. We're going to, to receive safety and security. What does that mean? And that's relating to what we were talking about in the previous point. So, I'm going through tribulation. I'm tired of this. Can I go to him and he's going to sort me out? Yes. Look. Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river. The glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. Then you shall feed you. This is God speaking to us. You shall feed. On her sides shall you be carried. God is telling us, you guys, this is what I'm going to do with you. I'm going to carry you and be dandled on her knees. You guys seen babies with their mothers? How safe they feel. The second the baby tries, someone tries to just hold them apart, to just kiss them, play with them, do anything with them, they start crying. Why? I'm not, I'm, I'm not a monster, I just want to play with you. But why? Because the safety of the babies are with their mothers. God is telling us, this is what am I to you. This is me to you. You guys are my babies. I am dangling you on my knees. This is the relationship. And even when this happens, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Might happen. Very unlikely. But even if this happened, though she may forget, I will not forget you. So guys, every, any, any time, any time, as Ibrahim was saying, I have forgo God has forgotten about me. He's saying, no, I haven't. Actually, guys, it's not even possible for me to forget you because I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. So actually, it's not possible for me to forget you. Like, you guys are there. You guys are on my hands. There is no way that I can forget you. And by the way, because we are engraved here, nothing can happen to us. Can you guys imagine? I want you to imagine a huge giant, yes, holding something in his hand. Can you try to get anything from his hand? No matter what you throw at him, he's a giant. Nothing, nothing will come anywhere near to you, right? You are in the giant's hand. This is God. We are in God's hands. What can come to us? If God is with us, who can be against us? This is what God is telling us. I am with you. I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Who can approach you? Oh, I'm scared of this guy to do this. I'm scared of my manager to do this. I'm going through this tribulation. These are nothing. All of this is absolutely nothing because we are in the hands of God. So if he allows something to happen to us, a tribulation, like Ibrahim was saying earlier, then we know that if he allowed this to happen, he's still protecting us. Listen to me, O house of Jacob and all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been upheld by me from birth. So I've been taking care of you since you were born. You have been carried from the womb. Just for a year or two up until you started walking? No. Even to your old age, I am he. Even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear and even I will carry and will deliver you. Guys, this is God's promise. He's saying, you guys are carried in my hands. 
No one can approach you. Nothing can come next to you. And this is the safety, this is the security that we need. When a child is walking with their parents, with their father, with their mother, they feel safe. I can cross the street fine because I'm holding daddy's hands. Right? This is, this is, this is the feeling that we need to have. We're walking through this life very different than anyone else. The rest of the world, they don't have God as their father, but we have God as our father. And if God is our father, nothing will scare me, no matter what it is. God is with me. He's taking care of me. No matter what happens, he's with me. But now, Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter, we are the work of your hands. I have a question. What does it mean but now? Lord, you are our father. What's the now? What happened for, that was Isaiah, to say now, Lord, you are our father? What's that now? It was a prophecy after the fall. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Anyone else? What's that now? Now, Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, you are our potter, we are the works of your hands. What's that now? So was he not before? Repairing the relationship. Yes. Who has... Fantastic. Thank you very much. Now, this is a realization that God is my father. The second that I realize, now, Lord, you are my dad. Khalas, we are in your hands. We are clay. You are the potter. Do whatever you want. I know that you're dad. I know that I'm in your hands. You're giving me that protection, that safety. Nothing ever will make me feel worried again. Now I realized that you are my dad. It's a realization that God is my dad. You're absolutely correct. Realization. And when we realize this, he said it very clearly. Do not worry. Your father in heaven knows all of the things that you need. And he's going to give them to you. Do not worry. Matthew 6, the whole passage, which we're going to read next week. Do not worry about tomorrow. Do not worry what you're going to eat. Do not worry what you're going to drink. Do not worry what you're going to wear. Why? Because I am in my dad's hands. What's going to happen? He's going to take care of me. Nothing ever can happen. Oh, third one. Sorry, it's written there. So the third one... So the first is love, second is safety and security. The third one is the inheritance. If I know that the God is my land, God is my father, any father will leave an inheritance to his children. So with God being our dad, what kind of inheritance do we have? Everything. Very good. Let's look. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So guys, everything that Christ has, we are going to have. Can you guys imagine? This is the plan from the very, very beginning. God created us from the very beginning to enjoy what everything he has we messed up we fell we are strayed away jesus came to remind us guys this is the plan i want you guys to remember you guys are heirs of the inheritance this is being heirs of the inheritance 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, look what he says, has begotten us again, like now we have received this sonship again and daughtership again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Any inheritance that we take from our earthly fathers will go away after a while. Year, two, thirty, forty, fifty, hundred max, and then the inheritance will go away. This inheritance will not fade away, reserved for us for good in heaven. This is what Jesus has said in John 17 when he was praying to the Father. The glory which you have given me, I have given them. And this is a wow moment. Every single time you guys read this verse, I want you to remember the glory that Jesus has is going to be ours. Do you guys imagine how crazy this is? To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. We're going to be sitting with Jesus on his throne in heaven. What kind of inheritance is this? There is nothing in comparison. Absolutely nothing. And this is when we realize that God is my dad. We can sit and think, when I go to heaven... I'm going to be sitting with Jesus on the throne. His glory is going to be my glory. Would that help us being going through tribulations now? Of course. If, if a poor guy knows that his dad is a very, very rich man, maybe he's not giving him all the money now, but he knows that he's going to inherit all of this one day. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If we talk to the, to the blind man, who was born blind all his life 40 odd years he was blind and we tell him today are you upset that God created you blind are you now upset that you were born blind without your vision I can promise you that he will tell you absolutely not I don't even remember these 40 years all I remember is due to my blindness I encountered him and when I encountered him, that's when I knew him. And when I knew him, I became his son. And when I became his son, I'm now enjoying heaven forever. So I don't care about anything anymore. These 40 years, they're nothing to me. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, and this is the most and last important bit, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance till we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So because we don't fully comprehend what we're going to inherit, God has sent his Holy Spirit in us as the guarantee that we're going to inherit in heaven. That this is what we're going to take in heaven. And it's a crazy way to think about it. God has given us his spirit as part of the inheritance that we're going to receive. So it's no more just the glory in heaven, but much more God himself, which have been given to us exceedingly great precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. And that's the actual inheritance that we're going to be having. God is telling us, guys, it's not that just you're going to live in glory. It's not just that you're going to have heaven. You are going to be partakers of my divine nature. Yes, we're not going to be fully like God, 
but we're going to receive from him more and more and more. And that's a mind-blowing thought, if you guys think about it. This is our inheritance. So we had love, and he's going to give us satisfaction. We had safety and security, and he's going to allow us to realize, giving us realization that we are engraved in his palm, in his hands. And then we have an inheritance, which is mind-blowing, that we can actually not fully comprehend when we say we are going to be partakers of the divine nature. And actually, if you think about it, we have seen people who are alive living this life today. We've seen Moses opening the Red Sea. We've seen Peter walking on water. We've seen saints healing and raising from the dead. Are these like magicians? No. They are partakers of the divine nature. So anything that you think of God, think about it for yourselves. My God is my dad. And anything that he is, he's going to give me. He's going to give me from his love. He's going to give me from his patience, from his gentleness, from his kindness, from his powers, from his healing. Whatever it is that you want, God is going to give you because this is who he is and we are his children. It runs in our DNA to receive from God. Summary. Does that make sense? Any questions so far? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to know if you had any responses you could give to people who don't fully understand the ways that we believe God is our Father. Because I know a lot of my Muslim friends will hear me refer to God as my Father and think that's blasphemy. God can't be your Father. God is way of, like, he transcends you. <clears throat> Come to spec. <laughs> that's, a, um, that's a very, very good question. If you're going to answer them, just answer them. Do you want to be his slave or his child? Because they believe even if you go to heaven, you're going to be his slave. So just tell them which one you want to choose. Ask myself, I don't want to be. That's what I thought. But when I came to Christianity, I realized I can just be his child. Who can we just uh, <coughs> take this? Have a powerful father, generous one, handsome. <laughs> you know, you can live with him. Just, just tell them this. You know, which which path do you want to choose? Being a slave or a child of God? It's a very hard concept, in all honesty. But anyone who's outside of the Christian faith they will always struggle with different concepts. You will speak to an atheist and they will think that we are coming from the evolution and our great, 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 great ancestor was a monkey or an ape. So that's their choice. Again, do you want to be the child of God or do you want to be the descendant of a monkey? That's their choice. Do you want to be, I'm so sorry to say it this way, guys, but it's the truth. Do you want to have God as just there in heaven and we are here and we have to live like that? Or do you want to believe that God is actually our dad? This is what he did. Because it's a whole story. Story from the very beginning. Why did God create us? He created us to test us. Because that's the Muslim belief. God is, has created us to test us. What kind of God is that? Sorry, Heb? I mean, I mentioned spec. <laughs> <laughs> So we go through all of these concepts and more in what we have as SPEC. SPEC is, is a course that we have called St. Paul Evangelism Course. We go through many, many different concepts of theology, trying to understand how to speak to others that are outside of the Christian faith, whether they are Muslims or atheists or whoever they are coming from. So we, we cover multitude of topics um, and how to portray to them Christianity? How do we explain to them Christianity altogether? Um, unfortunately, the course just finished. Uh, we're going to restart it back in September. Um, but we're going, we're going to give, 
to do different things up until then. Um, but the course is going to start again in September, God willing. Um, so it's... So guys, the, usually it's a Monday night, but um, if during Lent we're going to be having a Bible study uh, instead on Monday night. So if you're free on Monday night, come tomorrow, Father David is going to be leading us in the Bible study. And hopefully we'll start spec sooner than September, according to uh, Father David and Mina who lead us in that. Andy here. Um, so when, when you're speaking to your friends, they will not accept these concepts easily. But you cannot just throw one concept. You have to explain the whole story. So if they understand the creation, they might be able to understand. If they understand the fall, they might be understand this. It's, it's a whole concept. We need to go through every concept from the very beginning the creation, the fall, the incarnation, for them to finally be able to realize that God is our Father. Um, something I hear a lot from my Muslim friends as well is they really enjoy how I speak about God, and I don't even realize it. Um, like one of my friends says to me, you somehow make me a better Muslim just because of the way that you speak about God and how much love and passion you have for him. Like, you see him like as a father, don't you? And I'm like, yeah, I bet. Like, he's the best. And she's like, that in itself is so beautiful. And she's like, I try really hard to be like that. But I think, again, without like the foundations and the teachings of Christianity, I pray she gets there, but I don't know. So to respond to what my sister said, it's like, maybe sometimes it's not about teaching people with, oh, by the way, Genesis says this and this, and Mark says this and this. Sometimes it's just be who you are as naturally as you can be. And his light will shine through you. Every day, just pray for that. Pray that his light will shine through you just through the way you speak and the way that you act. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, I just wanted to add to that. Um, I always pray to God every day that whoever I see, um, whoever I speak to, he can speak through me. And God always says, like, not everyone will understand my words or what I say. And if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. So if someone does ask me something, I will know if it's meant to be, because he'll speak through me. Does that make sense? Fantastic. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes? No? Any comments? All right. So the summary is we've talked about three things, love, security, and inheritance. And as he had mentioned at the very beginning, we're going to go through Lent, through a journey. This journey is going to take us week by week, trying to discover a little bit more about God being our Father. It's a topic that we might know, we might have learnt about, but do we actually live it or we don't? Because I personally, as much as I could say that God is my dad, I don't fully live it. And that's a confession of Buddha. <laughs> Thank you. Um, because there are many, many, many aspects of the fatherhood of God. Whether they have been tainted by our earthly fathers, or whether it has been tainted by the community around us, by the culture, by our lack of understanding. It could have been tainted by many, many different things. How much do we understand and do we live the fatherhood of God? So this is what we're going to be going through. This is going to be the Lenten series throughout um, the whole of Lent up until we get there. And that's it. Thank you, guys. Any questions, any comments? Anyone wants to add anything? I can just make one comment at the end. Whenever you think <coughs> all the doors are closed, all the lights are off, you can't see anything. You can be sure of one thing. That's him there looking after you and waiting for you. And he won't reject you at any shape or form because he didn't do it to me. Who wasn't following him? He heard my cries. When I just I, I prayed one thing, 
when I was Muslim. It just held my, before I go to bed, it just held my head, uh, head high. I said, God, I don't want to die as an infidel. God is my witness, and he heard me. At the age of 248, he took my hand and said, come son. That was it. And believe me, you guys, he is the way, and he is the only way. There is no other way whatsoever. God bless all of you. Thank you, John. Uh, for those who don't know, John was baptized last week. So big clap to, her, to John. All right. Could we have a gentleman and a gentlewoman to pray for us? Any volunteers? so much for this amazing talk given by Mina Lord and I thank you so much for bringing us today all of us in fellowship I pray Lord that whoever missed this talk is able to hear it from mouths for those that were here I thank you so much God for being a father to us for being a father that exceeds all expectations for being that warmth and the definition of love for being someone that we can always rely on no matter what you never put your phone on silent you never say don't disturb Whenever we call, you answer. I thank you so much for your love. I thank you so much for your warmth. And I pray that we never ever forget this. I pray that even in trials and tribulations, we feel your love, we feel your warmth, that we understand and that we trust you. We trust that you do everything for our benefit, that every trial and tribulation is for our benefit. And it's just another way that you're showing us your love. I thank you so much, Lord, for everything you give us. Amen. God, thank you for bringing us to this very moment, this very hour, for protecting us, for loving us, for saying yes to us when we say no to you, for guiding us, for loving us, for being someone we can always turn to. Continue to guide us as we approach Lent, help us to grow closer to you, to grow stronger in faith, to grow stronger in hope. Help us to forget the things that are in this world, but to have our minds set up in the things that are within heaven, in the kingdom of heaven. Help us to be a reflection of you, to stay strong in faith, to always turn to you and to not turn to waste, wasteful things. Help us to be a reflection of you. Help others to see you in us. And help us to abide in you and you abide in us. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Prayers before you asking the intercessions of St. Mary, St. Mark, and all the angels and saints. Hear us, Lord, when we pray thankfully together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the, may the love of God, the Father, the grace of His own God and Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you and dwell within you. Go in peace and may the peace of the Lord be with you all. Do not go before you clean up, <laughs> or else the peace is not going to be with you.